All right. Technology is a wonderful thing. Uh, so today we have a very special guest. Usually you just get my sorry butt doing these things, but today we have Battalion Chief Ed Barrett from the Wake Forest Fire Department, who I would swear is probably the smartest guy that I know when it comes to incident command and emergency management. And he's going to share this presentation. I am asked from time to time what I think is the most important thing that you can have in your drone program. And the number one thing that I always say is good incident command structure, because you can have the best aircraft in the world, but if a department can't get their act together on how to use that information, it's kind of worthless. So let me just run through a few housekeeping things here. Uh, to the right, there is a couple of tabs there. You got the chat tab, questions and polls. There's actually a poll already for those who have attended one of my webinars before. Yep, you know how to use the poll tab. Uh, and it's just asking you who you fly for. In the chat tab today, while Chief Barrett is doing his presentation, I'm actually going to walk off camera here, sitting right off screen, and I'm going to be monitoring the chat tab. And uh, if you have a question for Chief Barrett, you have an observation, uh, put it in there, and I'm going to be moderating that and uh, poking him and asking those questions. We also have continuing education credits that are going to be available for this class. If you are a North Carolina-based public safety person, you will be able to apply and receive continuing ed credits. There will also be a test at the end of this class that you can take, and um, you'll uh, receive a certificate of achievement if you score 70% or better. So maybe, you know, make some mental notes along the way. If you uh, fail the test the first time, it'll show you what you got wrong. You can go back and take the test again. Um, I can't make a test any harder than I, I would be able to pass. So that's, uh, that's how you can do that. Then you get your fancy certificate of achievement, and uh, you can hold it up to your supervisor and show them what you really did today. So here's my personal disclaimer, and I will say that it applies to Chief Barrett as well. I am not the holder of all truth, and what you're about to hear is the result of my education and experience on the subject. And I strongly encourage you to constantly pursue learning and education along your journey. And most importantly, get out there and fly to test and see what works best for you. Uh, Chief Barrett and I have been out and we've tested these procedures before. Um, and we uh, had a very successful hands-on flight class where we did this. And we have proven these things work. And also with ICS, there's decades of proof that th these procedures do work. I always reserve the right to be wrong, but strive diligently not to be. All right. So I'm going back to the main slide. I'm going to jump over to the moderator tab and uh, Chief Barrett. Hello, everybody. Uh, before I get into introducing myself, I just want to uh, say that this is my first webinar experience. So if you see... Uh, me making some protocol mistakes on camera. Uh, just draw me, bring me with you. Uh, I want to take a direction to the first slide here, which is instant command flight ops. And the reason why I have this slide up is when you go out and you're dispatched on a mission, you're going to find yourself interacting with a lot of agencies. And these agencies, uh, some will have a lot of experience with flight ops and incident command, and then others will not. And somehow you're going to have to uh, work out uh, the best product that you can get. And if you have a good understanding of incident command and flight ops, and through classes like this, if we spread the word more and more, our jobs are going to be easier when we get out there to try to perform some work. All right, a little bit about myself. I have uh, 15 years of experience in uh, emergency services. I'm a battalion chief for the Wake Forest Fire Department on A shift. I am their emergency management officer currently at WCU, uh, trying striving to uh, earn a degree in emergency management uh, and disaster. I am also on the town of Wake Forest emergency management team. And then of course, uh, working with Steve, I do uh, UAS uh, ops development and support. Um, let's click on by here. 
Now, uh, today we're going to be discussing, of course, uh, ICS, flight ops, and then uh, how it uh, relates to in regards of search. And uh, that's primarily the information that we'll be delivering to you. And uh, we hope that you get uh, something good out of here. When you go out there and you know that you have a mission, uh, you have to make the best decisions you can with the resources you have. And ICS, the Incident Command System, is the perfect tool uh, or the best tool we have in order for us to understand what our resources are and then apply them in the way that hopefully will bring us to a successful mission. So uh, here in the overview, you can see the Three Stooges. That's typically what can happen if you have uh, terrible ICS skills. Uh, sometimes you just don't know what's going on. Uh, what we'll do is we'll discuss ICS and we'll uh, relate ICS structure. What we have found is a good structure for us when we go out and perform searches. We also do uh, flight operations. We'll review that. Uh, we also have a concept where during flight operations, we also have incorporate a observation post. And then uh, we'll discuss how we interact with operations itself. And then uh, we'll give you some pointers on search. Uh, this class is not about uh, search and search technique, but you, if you go out on missions, you'll find out that you're going to find resources out there that aren't trained particularly for search or, or for ICS. But, and what you have to do, though, is you have to provide them some information so you can actually perform the job that you've been sent on. Uh, so we'll, we'll go along with that. And uh, what I'd like to hear from you out there is if, uh, if anybody can go ahead and reply or to the chat and state uh, if they have uh, some ICS background or if they have some search background, it, it sure would be uh, nice to hear from you. Okay, the incident command system. Uh, it's been around for a long time. I've used it uh, over the past uh, 15 years and it is a valuable tool. It, uh, it helps me manage the situations that I get into, especially when I'm in the command position. And uh, I, without it, uh, it, it would be chaos, more chaos. You know how when you're on an emergency scene, the term chaos seems to happen anyway. Well, this manages your chaos and it, and it really helps. So um, when it comes to uh, flight ops, you have to use ICS. You have to be able to understand your resources. And then uh, not only that, speak in a common terminology and then uh, apply them in the correct way. Uh, the great thing about ICS is it divides workload, which makes it easy on you. Uh, I don't know about you, but I could probably do uh, three to five things well. Start going above five things, I need help. So that's why I have Steve. I get him to come over and help me on things. And then, uh, of course, it's scalable. It, if your uh, mission starts to grow on you, you can also uh, plug in resources into those positions that you need. And then... Um, and then, of course, it, it helps you on communications because you're using a common terminology. You have uh, the uh, lines of, uh, of uh, communication are between your different, uh, the, say, your flop, your finance, your logistics, your operations, your planning. Uh, you have a, a, a set management uh, input there that you can work with. Uh, a tricky question here is, can one person conduct flight ops? Well, the answer to that is yes, but can they do it effectively and efficiently? Uh, if you're conducting flight ops and you're flying your, your bird uh, and you have people that want to talk to you on a radio, that are trying to shout from you from the sideline, that uh, you're trying to keep an eye uh, looking for the target that you're going after, if all of a sudden you're getting overwhelmed with some information, you're not going to be really effective trying to find a target that you've been sent out to try to find. So uh, one person, yeah, you can conduct flight ops, but you're not going to be uh, too good at it. Uh, what you need around you is you need a team and you need the uh, incident command system. So Chief, we do have some feedback here from mm -hmm. our students. A lot of them uh, do have some sort of ICS experience mm -hmm. uh, and have taken NIMS classes, ICS training, a lot of ICS classes. Uh, Jason is an ICS 400 and he's an instructor. And we have uh, people who have gone all the way up with uh, 700, 800 classes. 
Excellent. That's excellent. Uh, the more ICS you get, and I'm sure Jason would agree, the better off you are when you're managing and uh, leading uh, your, your troops out there trying to get a mission completed. Uh, one thing that Steve and I have found when we go out to uh, other jurisdictions is a lot of times when we get there to start setting up flight operations, they tend to want to uh, shift a command to us. And um, that's really not how it works. Uh, when you go out, to, if you get dispatched and you're going to other jurisdictions, you have to let them know that they are the authority with uh, uh, that has jurisdiction and that they need to uh, maintain command. Because then what we do is we have to call on them for the resources that we feel we might need as the mission unfolds. Um, we are, as it says on the slide there, that we are a resource that reports actionable intelligence to operations. And so uh, uh, if you try to take on when you get to a place, especially if you go to a place that you're unfamiliar with and you try to take on a command mode also, you know, you're going to be lacking the uh, knowledge and resources of that area. So Chief, from your experience, what mm -hmm. percentage of time do you think that that actually happens perfectly? Never. Never. <laughs> <laughs> um, it is be It does get better, but uh, uh, there's there's always that that um, attempt to slide uh, a little where, into like roles that you shouldn't be performing out there. You know, it's it's easy to get sucked in to uh, making decisions where the say the authority that has jurisdiction should be making those decisions. Hey, can so, you share with everybody the the story about? that night that we had to go fly to find the missing girl? Yes. Um, we, we were called around two or three o'clock in the morning, uh, last, uh, I think it was last summer. Yeah. And, uh, the, what they had was they had a, uh, suicidal person who had uh, left a note and, um, and so they called us, asked us to come out and fly a mission to see if we can find this person. It was in a rural area. So at night, so we were going to use the flare camera and we uh, went ahead and to, uh, set up the flight operations area, took off and began our search. Well, you know, uh, the, we'll probably get to this a little bit later when it comes to the briefing, the briefing that you want to get from command. Um, we learned later that that in the note there was valuable information that would have helped us conduct our search in uh to a certain location than where we were so we wasted a lot of battery we wasted a lot of flight time and um when we could have actually directed our search to the primary area but we'll get to that a little bit later but that that right there it tells you something about incident command authority having jurisdiction and trying to work together with the resources and agencies that are going to be out there on the uh, incident ground with you. Just uh, if you keep that in mind, try to uh, make those lines of communication stronger and hopefully we'll be better for it in the end. Okay, um, what I have here is a slide that gives you what we use as a incident command structure. Of course, you have your incident commander and then you have operations. And when we arrive on scene, we are assuming the flight ops role with a chief pilot and assistant pilot. And what we normally do is no matter where we are in the state that we go to, back home at Wake Forest Fire Department, we set up an observation post. So the observation post is getting the same video feed that we are sending to operations or the one that we're looking at ourselves. So what we found out is we want as many eyes on that picture as possible so they can, uh, for two reasons, they can act as observers and observers are, are out there to try to make sure that our bird is safe in the air. If, if an observer sees that the bird is flying and it might come into contact with say power lines, uh, it's not a good thing. So that's one uh, function the observation post uh, looks at. And then the other thing they're doing is they're looking for targets just like we are. And uh, there's a way that we can communicate to each other and we'll see that a little bit later on in some of the slides here. So then what you have now is you have flight ops with their uh, distinctive jobs, and we'll get into those also, of uh, reporting actionable intelligence to operations. Then what operations does is they go ahead and they take that actionable intelligence and they go ahead and send out their search teams. And uh, no matter how many they are, and what we'll do with uh, our search teams is we'll also give you some hints on accountability. Uh, so we, 
we can communicate well with through operations with the search teams that are in the field. If I'm going too fast, let me know. <laughs> uh, flight ops. Okay, here we are. The, the call comes in and we're sent out and we're, we have a mission. And flight ops, uh, we go and we report to command at the authority that has jurisdiction. And we have to know some things. And uh, we want to know who and what our target is. And uh, uh, these are just some of the the uh, things that this isn't, and you're not just kept to these. If there's other information out there that's not on here, you definitely uh, can uh, get it from uh, flight out or from the IC. Uh, when was the target last seen is always an important one. Uh, sometimes uh, Steve and I have been on a mission and then we found out that the target last was seen 48 hours ago. Well, that, that kind of, that kind of puts a, a cramp in, yeah, I mean, why am I here? Yeah, why, why are we here? If it's been 48 hours, uh, a lot of times you, you might never get a heat signature off or something like that. But getting past that, uh, what is the description of the target? Because you might not be going after people every time. You could be going after a uh, automobile, a plane. We had a plane down in uh, Bun uh, last week, and our target would have been a plane. Uh, what is the geography that we'll be working in? A lot of times, for especially for safety's sake, we need to know what our geography is. Uh, have to know how high to fly. Um, we have to know what the extra hazards in the area are. Uh, are we going to have uh, power lines, uh, towers, uh, anything that could uh, inflict harm on the uh, aircraft as it's flying? And then, and then, are there points of interest? Let's say, uh, particularly, that uh, somebody has uh, has a history of uh, getting lost and they are in a rural area but they always seem to go to the same rocky outcrop that's uh, like two miles away well that's a point of interest a anything like that a body of water where they used to fish all the time or anything like that that's something uh, important to know and then of course any other witness intelligence so the, the point here is when you report to the IC, you get as much information as possible. Because as we were saying before, we've been through some missions before where we actually found out that they had additional intelligence that we were never briefed on. So we, 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 we try to correct ourselves on those right there. Right, Chief, I, I, I like the feedback on this. Yeah. Um, as a pilot, if somebody isn't there to help me, Mm -hmm. I always like to try to get as close as possible to the original source of information, like talk to the wife or talk to the son. Or that is, that is true. Uh, any witnesses around that know something? Uh, any uh, family members that can tell you something? Because a lot of times, family members, you know, um, you know, we go to accident scenes sometimes, and or or medical calls, and we we get some information from these people. And then we go ahead and we turn around and we give it to the paramedics when they come. Well, what happens a lot of times is when the paramedics start talking to them, they start getting additional information. Well, if you put yourself in the position to where you are the person that's going to go out and talk to the people that actually know the most or are closest to the target or closest to the person that might be missing or, or whatever the issue might be, they're going to, they're probably going to give you some information that you're not going to get from IC because IC doesn't consume it all. Uh, so, uh, yeah, use everything you can use, try to extract information from all, all the areas that you can, when you go out on a mission, uh, it, you might even be able to extract information, uh, by knowing the kind of weather that you're having. You just use, uh, all kinds of resources if you think about it. And, uh, and then you'll be better off for it. It will make for hopefully a more successful mission. All right, let's get uh, into uh, the actual uh, creating of our flight ops and, and our ICS type of uh, situation here. So Chief, let me interject. Yeah. Um, for our students, the title assistant pilot is also the person who's responsible if they are designated as a visual observer. Yes, yes. Yes, uh, I'll, I'll put it this way too, is uh, I fill the assistant pilot's role uh, when we go out on our missions, but I am not a pilot. Uh, but what I do is I assist the pilot with all the needs that he, I, what I'm, my job is to take the workload off him so he can concentrate on flying the mission. 
because his his attention needs to be on flying that bird, making sure it's safe, and looking for uh, what our target is. So uh, flight operations consists of the chief pilot, an assisted pilot, and as we stated earlier, we actually use a, an observation post that's remote. And then the, what I have here is I have some specific tasks that the chief pilot is responsible for. And uh, he is the sole person that uh, gives the go, no go on whether this operation is going to be flown. Uh, incident command can't tell him to fly. Uh, operations can't tell him to fly. I might bug him, but I can't tell him to fly. Uh, he has to understand what his environment is. Is it safe to fly? Is there a reason to fly? And, and, and Steve goes into that much better than I do. But uh, when it comes down to it, the chief pilot is the, is the person that tells you whether this mission is going to be flown or not. He's the one who has his, uh, what do you got, licenses, credentials. Oh, yeah. Uh, I he, got lots to lose. He's got lots to lose. And uh, there's nobody out there that's going to be able to uh, tell him that he has to fly when they don't, ha they don't have that much to lose. So uh, he also is the best person to select the LZ and the flight ops area. Uh, he, he knows the capabilities of his aircraft the best. He knows the capabilities of, as far as uh, battery life that he has. He wants to get as close to the incident and be in a safe location as possible. So he, he'll take all that information into consideration and he'll, he'll select a, a good LZ for us. Um, pilots, he pilots the UAS. That's his primary job. And then he identifies targets. So we try to keep his job simple, his life simple. Now, the assistant pilot is the role that I normally play, and uh, I have a little bit more on my plate, but I can, I can do that because I don't have to worry about flying and running into something with a UAS. Uh, I take care of all communications between flight operations and anybody else, whether it be the observation post or be uh, observa or, um, operations and, or somebody off to the side of the, of the incident trying to get our attention. I take care of all communications. Uh, I, I go ahead and radio all actionable intelligence that way, or I receive any intelligence that comes back at me or any requests for information. Uh, I also act as an observer. I'm actually, the screen that uh, Steve is looking at, I have a screen in front of me. It's the same screen as the observation post, and sometimes the operations will be looking at screen also. So we have a lot of eyes on the screen, and uh, I act as an observer also. If I see one time we were flying a flight, we had a, uh, yeah, a per rescue. person in distre distress, water rescue out in the middle of a reservoir, and uh, Steve was up flying, and he was uh, heading out uh, to the location to make contact with our subject, and. It was very hard to see, but there was high power lines that were uh, draped across the um, the reservoir. I happened to notice it from the vantage point that I was in, so I radioed to Steve and said, well, hey, we have power lines out there. He was able to check up, understand where they were, and then uh, continue on with the mission. So the observer role we have found actually works. Uh, I also identified targets. Uh, as, as Steve's flying a mission, and, and we fly uh, two kinds of searches, and we'll get into that a little later also. One we call a direct search, and another one we call an indirect search. And so when we're, when we're flying either one of those types of missions, or you can combine them, you can actually do two at a time. But uh, we, uh, we identify targets as we go along, or if we feel we found the target, we, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll, relay, we'll stay on top of that target. Uh, I also do flight support. I'm going to set up for Steve as he's preparing uh, some of the equipment that he needs to uh, use during flight ops. I'm going to set up a secure LZ. I'm going to make sure that I tape off an area where we cannot be interfered. Where uh, He's going to hopefully pick a place where uh, we have as little traffic as possible when it comes to outside uh, people. Uh, I'll also uh, make sure that the as the bird will not be interfered by anything that's around us. And uh, if anybody comes over to try to engage us, I'm the one that has to break off and, and let them know uh, what we're doing, that we're conducting a flight ops and that the, the pilot is actually busy. Yeah, essentially you create yeah. a safety bubble around me. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, I also report, as I said earlier, actionable intelligence to operations and I keep accountability. 
And you'll see why when we talk about accountability, why it's important for uh, me in flight ops to understand what's going on on the op on the uh, operations side. Uh, and uh, in fact, we'll head in that direction right now. Okay, let's talk about the observation post. Uh, the observation posts also now. Do we still do a YouTube yeah. video? Yeah, I We're, just sent the link to the device that we use in the chat. Okay, we what we do is we use a YouTube video feed so everybody can see the same thing, and and then the you'll see the clock is there because the clock is a means of communications that we use when we talk to each other about what we're looking at. Um, the observation post identifies targets. They also are observers. They communicate with me, the assistant pilot, and then they also keep accountability because they have to understand the resources that are out there and what their assignments are. Uh, using the clock method, uh, let's, uh, uh, some, of, some people might already understand uh, how we use the clock method when it comes to uh, directing people. You take that clock and you put it over the screen that you're looking at. So you're looking at a picture of an area that you're searching. The center of the clock, of course, is your search team heading toward 12 o'clock. And as they're walking and they need to turn in whatever direction that you have a target on, you're able to communicate to them over the radio, say, uh, search team one, uh, I have you. Uh, what I need you to do is I need you to turn toward 10 o'clock and continue walking straight. So they go ahead, they turn to a 10 o'clock direction. And now their 10 o'clock becomes their 12 o'clock again, and they start walking. And so they're walking toward 12 o'clock. And if you need to turn them again, if you have to turn them toward 1 o'clock or toward 10 o'clock again, then you can relay that using the clock method over the radio. It's a, it works well. We've, we've done it many times. And uh, I just want, you got my six on this? Yeah, well, you know, we have run into one situation where yeah. we had two people. Mm -hmm. And we didn't know who was the primary person. Oh, that's true. Um, and and what we've done with that is we've figured out, uh, well, accountability will, will, will lend a, an answer to that. When you have, just think of it, the, here you are, you're searching, your, your camera is sending back, uh, a picture back, and you have a whole bunch of human activity in the frame. Because sometimes you're going to have other people besides searchers out in your area. Well, you have to be able to tell the difference between who's who the who the search teams are, and then who what's what is just like basic human act activity. And we have answers for that, and we'll get to those as we go along. Okay. okay. Operations responsibilities. Operations receives targets from the assistant pilot, and they and they are the ones that assign it to search teams. Uh, that's their ICS responsibility. Uh, the uh, flight operations people shouldn't be assigning tasks or getting involved in the resources that are going out there to perform the search because it takes away from the job that you're doing there. Uh, we track uh, search teams with uh, GPS locations. We'll give them a GPS location that they have to go toward if they have a smartphone or any kind of uh, device that they can bring GPS on. They punch it in and then they just start going toward their... We also may send you out uh, toward a landmark. If you can see in the distance the big oak tree on top of the mountain, that, then uh, we may send you there. You don't have to get a GPS location or any other kind of geograph we can send you to. All right, Chief. Uh, we do have a good a question here. Mm -hmm. um, Yarn wants to, uh, Robert wants to know, do you sync the clock to cardinal headings? I tell you the truth, I don't even know what a cardinal heading is. Well, you know, north, south, east, west. Oh, okay. So, I, I mean, guys, my preference is, so I'm flying, especially at night, you're using the thermal camera. I usually just tell the person to stick their arm straight out in front of them, mm. and that becomes their 12 o'clock. Yeah. yeah, in front of you is always 12 o'clock, no matter where you're at, no matter what direction you're, you're facing in, north, south, east, or west. If you're walking in a certain direction, you're heading at 12 o'clock. Uh, behind you is 6. So... Uh, so it's always going to be the same. And then when you turn, if somebody turns you, uh, wants you to uh, say head in a three o'clock direction. Now you're heading toward, you turn toward three o'clock, but as you start walking, now you're heading, you're 12 o'clock again, because you have to be able to move that person. How are you going to keep up with it? If you say, oh, well, I'm going at three o'clock, but now he wants me to go seven o'clock. Now you got to, you got to have one standard. You have to be always heading to a 12 o'clock so you can be turned correctly. 
Um, I hope that answers the question. Um, uh, operations responsibilities, also uh, accountability. And we're going to see a, an accountability chart here shortly, and you'll, you'll, you'll get an idea about how accountability, A, why is it important, and then what are the things you want on your accountability board that uh, will give you effective information. Uh, we use it to track uh, search teams and, and the personnel that are assigned to those teams. It's very important that if you have uh, three individuals or two individuals on a team and they're out in the woods searching, that in case they go missing. Uh, just, like, just like in firefighting, you want to know who's in the building if it's on fire. So if something happens, you, you know who. Uh, operations and flight ops must track the Jeep and the uh, landmark addresses that they give to their teams. They, we must know to which location or, or a, which GPS point or which landmark. If you don't know that, then you have confusion out there. When you try to uh, direct somebody uh, off a search to another search, you want to know who the closest uh, search teams are to those points. And the only way you can do that is by understanding accountability. Uh, provide search teams with uh, operations GPS locations. Now, this is an important one. If you send a team out uh, and they're going toward a, a location, GPS location, they get out there, sun goes down, gets dark, they get turned around, and all of a sudden they go, well, which way is home? Well, when, before you send a search team out to go search, make sure they know what the GPS location of home is. Uh, we don't want our teams getting lost and having to go find them too. Now, here's an accountability board that we found uh, is most effective for us. So this is a big whiteboard. Yeah, this is a big whiteboard. We actually, we, if in the previous slide, yeah. there's a picture of you. There we there, go with the accountability board. Yeah, and all that information that's on that next slide is on that board right now in front of me. Um, uh, on that particular day, I think we were tracking three teams. And um, it, it comes in very handy. You're able to manage your resources with, with some efficiency. And, uh, and it takes all the questions out of who is doing what and who is where. And before you start, let me just say, yeah. if anybody wants a copy of this, uh, take a screenshot of it right now. So you've got it instantly. But you can also uh, download this presentation when it's done. A little cloud there in the right, upper right. You should be able to download it. Everybody has access to the replay, so you'll be able to see it later. Okay, uh, as you can see, this is the Flight Ops Accountability Board. Uh, what we envision is that not only does Flight Ops have one of these, but the Observation Post has one, and, the, and of course, Operations should definitely have one because they're the ones that are directly uh, in contact with the resources that we're using. Uh, the first thing on the board up there, of course, is what we just talked about, uh, having the GPS location of where base is, where home is. So when they get out there, if they get turned around or if the sun goes down and things start looking different, that they have a direction that they can go into and uh, return safely to home. Uh, on this particular day, as you can see, let's go down to the target uh, part of the slide here. Now you see we had some missing hunters. They were both males. One was 25 named Terry. One was 35 named Bill. This is some of the information that we acquired from Incident Command when we got on scene. Of course, the, because they were hunters, they were wearing orange. Uh, the, the intel was they did not return at seven when they were expected. Uh, the terrain that they were operating in were heavily wooded with some paths. Uh, when you move over to the right, we have the radio channel that we're working on, TAC-13. And then we have some notes here. And these notes are just to give uh, some pointers or some hints to some of the teams that are going to go out there and perform a search. Because a lot of times when you get on scene, you have resources there that have various stages of, um, of uh, knowledge when it comes to search or ICS. And so a lot of times you got to go ahead and give them a little down and dirty class so they, they're able to operate effectively inside your, um, your, your mission. And so, what we do is we always give them a little bit of a briefing, each one of our, our search teams, because sometimes they could just be volunteers. They don't, they're not always going to be emergency management or emergency personnel. So you, some of the notes we give them is we say, hey, human beings like to uh, follow the path of least resistance when you're going out and you're searching for these people. If you come to a briar patch that's 
a half a mile long in either direction, you can probably bet that the person that went missing did not walk through that briar patch. So you, you want to take the path of least resistance uh, in order to make your search a little bit more effective. Human beings tend to go downhill. They also tend to gra gravitate toward water. Um, one of the things that we teach our people is we don't know if we're operating in a crime scene or not right now. They may be missing on their own accord, but then again, there could be a, it could be a, a crime that's in process. So what we do is we ask our people to always observe the fact that they could be walking into a crime scene. If they find any kind of uh, evidence along the way, it could be a hat on the ground, a bag of candy uh, that you radio back with the GPS location of it is because it could be uh, put into evidence and then mark it with some yellow tape. So when we go out to look for that area again, it's a little bit easier to see. Um, a, a big thing we ask them is we ask them to act as observers. And what their the observer job, of course, is, is as they see the uh, UAS uh, flying above them, if they see that there's anything that could harm that UAS, that they get on that radio and they uh, call out pilot stop. When Steve hears pilot stop or any of you pilots out there hear pilot stop, you know, it's the best thing to do is go ahead, stop, assess what the situation is, understand what it is, and then proceed on as, as you, as you would. And then, uh, as far as other commands that we, we brief them on is we ask them to tell us if target is found. And that's if through the intelligence briefing that they received is the person that they found or the thing item that they found what was in the briefing if they did find something because sometimes we have targets that we send you to and it doesn't always turn out to be the target we're looking for a lot of times we want to know what that target is because we won't be able to next time we see that target from the air we can say oh that's just a rock that has absorbed heat from the uh, day or that's a manhole cover uh, so it's always good to share the intelligence uh, back if, if when they find what they think is the target and it's not the target, let us know what it is. And then we get down to accountability section here. Uh, you see team one here. We had Captain Timberlake, uh, firefighters, Gov and May, and they were giving a GPS location to go toward. So since they received a GPS location, most likely we were flying an indirect search on this one. Uh, I'll touch on indirect search here real quick. Indirect search is Steve has so much battery, battery life for this UAS to fly. So he wants to cover as much ground as possible. So if he goes out and he sees a target, he's not going to hover over that target and waste battery life. He's going to mark that target with GPS. We'll, we'll uh, send a team out with that GPS location and they start walking toward that target or riding toward that target, depending on their mode of transportation. And Steve continues on. And he might find and mark another target. And they might find and mark another target. So that's an indirect search. We have people searching out there, but we're not directing them uh, anymore from the uh, UAS. The second team here uh, is uh, Jackson, Captain Jackson, Lieutenant Eason, and they're performing a direct search. That means that somehow Steve and I have decided, along with the intelligence that we're getting, that that we, our UAS is hovering over the exact target we were looking for. We have clearly identified it. And with that UAS hanging over that target, there's a few benefits you get from it. First of all, we, we have uh, the search team can actually see it and walk toward it and not have to worry about uh, following a GPS anymore. Uh, the, the other things is we can actually see and observe that target and see if there's any distresses that are going on. And uh, sometimes we do have the capability of actually interacting with our target with some of the equipment that Steve has rigged on, on the UAS. Yeah. You want to say anything about that, Steve? Nope. Okay. <laughs> All right. Steve, Steve is very handy. He, he has rigged um, a communications platform. Uh, we're able to drop cell phone. We're able to drop uh, um, flotation devices. Uh, and it's all through this uh, somehow, um, who is that guy that used to be able to uh, solve things? With? Oh, yeah, Rube Goldberg? No. Oh. <laughs> no uh, he was on TV. He, he was always... Oh, he, MacGyver? He, yeah, MacGyver. <laughs> Steve is our MacGyver when it comes to uh, fashioning all kinds of uh, neat things to uh, make the capabilities of that UAS even better. 
And I'm sure one day those packages will be just normal on them, but Steve's ahead of us at all. Um, we also have an accountability board is we have a reserve team uh, by uh, Lieutenant Hanford and Stauffer. And what we normally do is we have a reserve, of course, back if one, if one of our teams out there identifies a target and we need to, uh, and they're not mobile, we have these guys, they have, are on an ATV with a backboard, with medical supplies, and they go in and they go after them w with, uh, with an additional resource. That's an additional resource for us. And then, of course, flight ops would be uh, Road and Barrett, uh, the team. And then uh, on this particular mission day, we did not have an observation post, so that was NA. We always mark our start time and then uh, time found. And that's, that's a basic accountability board. And you don't have to stick to this. You may have other information that you find valuable that could go on here. Uh, but the, the, uh, the gist of the whole thing is make sure that there is accountability, make sure that ICS uh, system is being used. Uh, it's the perfect management tool for the things that we do. Now let's uh, let's talk about search types. We we discussed it a little bit already. Uh, direct and indirect. The direct you uh, hover over your target and you talk them in uh, using the clock method. Uh, a lot of times you don't really have to rely on talking them in too much, except for if you see say some geography that they need to get around easier, and uh, and or basically they can just walk to it because they see where that uh, that UAS is hovering. And of course, uh, they're, they're familiar with the, uh, the terminology of nothing found or state the object found or the target is found. And then of course, on the indirect search, as we said, the uh, UAS will continue its search pattern after uh, providing a GPS location for teams to go after and they're not directed. Uh, we're, not, we're not gonna stay on top of them and watch them as they go. We're just gonna keep trying to find targets. And so they're, they're doing the indirect search. Uh, and then, of course, they have the same terminologies as far as if something's found or not found. So some search pointers, and we touched on this a little bit on the accountability board, but it's, it's worth reviewing again. Uh, human beings love to take the path of least resistance. Uh, we, we tend to walk down hills and not up hills. It's uh, when people are lost, it's very rarely that they're going to climb a mountain they're actually going to find a valley first. Uh, water, uh, for some reason, people like to levitate toward water. <laughs> levitate. And then um, crime scene. And make sure that when you're out there and you're getting involved in these searches and you're finding uh, things along the way, as you're walking along the way, uh, a shirt, a shoe, uh, just anything can be evidence uh, that you uh, mark it with GPS. It's going to Law enforcement will be your best friend when, when they're getting uh, a pristine scene, something where you haven't touched it, you've just marked it. It, it, it makes for a better uh, chain of custody, I would imagine, for their evidence. And uh, then, of course, here's uh, Steve and I trying to find our contact inside that uh, bale of hay right there. <laughs> search teams. Uh, we, we organize our search teams in a certain way. Uh, of course, you can organize them and equip them the way that you, you feel uh, you need to. Of course, each situation is going to be different, so they may carry different equipment than what I have here, but uh, this is just uh, for instance. Uh, we, we found it's very valuable that you have a team of two. <clears throat> when you're out there, as we said before, and you're conducting a search, you may have other human activity in the area. Well, a lot, it's a little bit easier to tell the difference between a search team and human activity when you have a team of two walking together in the, in the same direction. Because a lot of times human activity is a little bit more chaotic on the ground when you uh, view it from the air. And, but uh, that's a good way to mark your team is you can see them walking. Another one, way to tell them between anybody else is if you do doubt uh, is that your team or not, you can have them... Uh, shine a flashlight into the air and as soon as they if you say hey i need you to put your flashlight in the air then you see them or as steve said earlier you can ask him put your arm out straight in front of you and once you see the person do that you can tell hey that's your that's our team it's a team of two one person is a navigator and the navigator also operates the radio that way 
if you had like the observer had the radio and the navigator had the navigational device, just the communications between the two of them is uh, could add to either delay or misinformation. If you have the person who's a navigator uh, radioing the information, it's a more direct path of communications. So we found that works better. Uh, the search teams will respond to either a GPS location or a landmark or for to try to find their target. And of course, down there is the same terminology as, as we've seen before is uh, state what's found, nothing found. And remember the pilot stop is a, very, is a safety uh, command. As far as equipment, how we equip our, our teams when we send them out is we give them a GPS device or usually they're using their uh, smartphones. Uh, we'll put a compass on them, uh, a flashlight. Of course, they're gonna have a radio, have to have communications. We always have an ATV out there to whenever we find somebody who is not mobile, we can actually send the ATV in and grab them. Uh, you can send your ATV out and they can be part of a search. But if your ATV is way over on this side of the county, when you found your person over this side of the county, it sometimes it causes for delay unless you have enough resources where you have enough ATVs all over the place. And then, of course, we, we try not to load down our um, teams with a lot of medical equipment. We want to give them just what we feel uh, is necessary. So what we normally carry is we do uh, tourniquets and pressure bandages, uh, uh, water, a thermal blanket, and then if we happen to have intelligence where we know that they need a certain medication and they needed it fast and they were missing it, we might be able to send that medication along on those search teams. It's, it's all on how you tailor the, your equipment when you're going out and what your intelligence is, what you're looking for. And then of course, scene tape. Scene tape so in case you do find evidence, you're able to mark your locations. And if there's any questions on this or if anybody has any ideas on uh, other equipment devices that are that you deem necessary, I'd like to hear it because we're always trying to improve what we do. Here's just a little something on the capabilities of our uh, particular unmanned aerial. It's uh, we got the flare camera uh, and uh, flare camera is pretty useful. We, we've uh, we've learned. Uh, a lot. Uh, we can tell the difference between all kinds of animals. So we yeah. know what a horse and a, a difference between a horse and a deer and a human and um, and river otters. Yeah. Uh, oh, you got to tell that story. Uh, we we were sent on a um, a mission. Um, excuse me, a mission down um, in Rocky Mount, North Carolina. It was a, a missing uh, elderly gentleman. They found his car in a river, and he was missing. And uh, so they sent us down and we put the bird up in the air. This, this is another one of those ones where we found out that he went missing about 24 hours earlier, which kind of made uh, a heat signature type of search uh, moot at that point. But we didn't know that at the time we were up in the air and we were searching and we saw a heat signature along the river. Well, this was one of those times too, where uh, we happened to have not the resources that we needed from incident command when we got on scene. So I left the, our area and went out looking for that target because it was fairly close by. And when I got to the target, this animal, yeah, <laughs> probably probably uh, 50 pounds and huge, jumped out of the water at me. And uh, Steve heard some expletives on the uh, <laughs> on the radio that, that that weren't supposed to be said over FCC or FAA, whatever it is, license and stuff. But. Uh, but uh, yeah, they, it turned out to be a river otter. I never knew river otters were that big. And I won't go near the Tar River anymore. Um, and then we have a 400 zoom camera. And that that is an impressive camera. I know the people out there that use it, you know it. Uh, we can see, it seems like from a quarter mile away, I can read your license plate. And, uh, and I actually, uh, we've used it on a lot of events and we were able to identify people really like uh, about a quarter mile away we could tell who that person is because we knew that person hey there's there's billy uh so that's that's an impressive camera i really like it um of course uh, we've rigged it for speaker communications so that we can talk to the person uh we we haven't we don't have two-way communications yet but we can ask them stuff like are you okay if you're okay raise your right hand and we're able to uh, communicate in that regard 
Um, we use it as a delivery platform, and, and of course, we can deliver uh, flotation devices uh, when needed. Now, uh, at this time, I hope I didn't uh, run through that too quick, uh, and I hope it was some good, valuable information for you, at least uh, give you some ideas, and you can tailor some things the way that you want them to, or what's most effective for you, really, because that's what it comes down to. And then, um, and of course, I always, always have to say that uh, using the ICS system is a must. It will manage your resources the best. It will uh, cut out on a lot of chaos. Uh, and if anybody has any questions, uh, I definitely would love to field some. All right. Well, let me move on to the next slide. Let's change chairs for a hey, second. Thank you, everybody. It's good seeing you. And I'll wrap this up, bring it in for landing. All right, guys. Enough of me chatting off screen. Lee says, nice job. Thank you. Uh, there's a feedback uh, poll over there in the poll tab. Please take it and uh, give Chief Barrett some feedback on what you thought of his presentation. You can always contact me with any questions you might have. Sroad at wakeforestfire.com. The Chief Barrett is e Barrett at wakeforestfire.com. And uh, please don't hesitate to reach out to him. Anything that you've got, please share it with him. All right, now, continuing ed credit. So write this down or open a second browser. For those who are North Carolina based public safety, go to psflight.org. Uh, that's my website, psflight.org slash CE. Uh, for continuing ed, that'll take you to the online PDF form to fill out. If you don't have anything to write, your pen's not working, don't forget you've always got the replay of this, and uh, you can go back and look at that address again. Speaking of addresses, here is the address that you want to go to to take the online test. I think, oddly, it's 11 or 12 questions. I usually shoot for 10, but this one, uh, we had some extra questions. Uh, Chief Barrett took the test yesterday without reviewing his own material, and he got 100% downloaded his certificate. You'll be able to download your certificate, psflight.org slash IC-27 will be the online test. And that is it. Uh, the presentation did, did give me some ideas of some new things that we should do. In fact, probably should do a webinar about video streaming platforms and what works best. And um, maybe something on the best setup or a, a good setup for a response vehicle. But more presentations coming. Right now I'm working on the night flight webinar that will be coming up. Uh, scheduling in a couple weeks. You'll watch your emails and uh, you'll get notice of that. If there are no more questions, we are going to say goodbye. But let's see. Uh, we did have two questions that I couldn't answer. So... We're going to get more information uh, on those, and people are responding to the polls. So thank you so much, everybody. Uh, have a good day.